my advice to them is, you know, they've saved their whole life. They have plenty of money. They, they'll be able to do whatever they need to do. That's our job to make sure that you have plenty of money. But when you're going through and picking out the fixtures in this new house, spend a little bit more on the cabinets, right? You've earned it. Like the money's there. Like if once you figure out what you want to do, what your path is in retirement, do it the right way. You're not going to look back in five or 10 years saying, shoot, you know what? I wish I would have got those less expensive cabinets. You're just not going to do that. We've never, we've never had anybody do that. Y'all ready for this? Welcome to the Dan DeVerna Podcast, where we talk about business, life, and how to win it both. So we're, we're here today, and I'm, I'm here with one of the guys I work with who uh, goes by the name of Steve Decker, and Steve and I wrote a book together and he was really the driving force behind it. So we'll mainly hear from Steve, but Steve, why don't you tell us before we get into the book stuff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I started in the business uh, back in 2008, which was about the uh, outside of this year, potentially the worst possible time you could start in this financial planning business. I was going through all of the various testing you have to go through and going through all the exams and getting all that stuff done as the market was crashing in 2008. And I was pretty fortunate in this business where my, it's, it's a family business. My dad has been doing this since I was, uh, since I was born, since the early eighties, my dad's been in this business. And I guess you could kind of say, I grew up in this business a little bit. And uh, back in 2008, he had a partner at the time who, uh, whose name was uh, a gentleman by the name of Forrest Gorkowski. And Forrest was in his early 70s looking to kind of transition out. And I was kind of trying to figure out my path in life and what I wanted to do. And dad and Forrest approached me. They said, well, why don't you come on and train with Forrest a little bit? Um, he'll introduce you to all his clients. And then you can slowly kind of transition into, uh, you know, taking over his practice. And we started that in 2008. And then in 2010, uh, Forrest was pretty much out completely, and I was running his practice at that point. So, and from there, we've taken that practice from here, and we've grown it up to here. And, you know, a lot of that's been with market growth, but we've had just a tremendous inflow of new clients over the last seven or eight years as well. So that's really helped with the growth. That's awesome. So, yeah, so, it's, so, so yeah, Steve, Steve's here in, in Perrysburg with me, so I see him you know, a couple, few times a week, depending upon the week. He's out and about a lot more than I am getting after it and uh, traveling across the United States, which I think is at least a little bit of how this book kind of came about. So um, yeah, why don't you get into that, Steve? Like what made you decide you wanted to write a book in the first place? Yeah, I think I think it kind of all started with you and I uh, a Friday afternoon at some some uh, at a various spot in Perrysburg. After we got off work, we were uh, you know tossing around you know some kind of ideas and some similarities that we had in clients. And I knew um, you know you've written several books, and this this is the first book that I've written. So it's kind of picking your brain a little bit about what's interesting and you know how is the books that you've written, how has that transitioned into new business for you? How do you use those books? And that sparked the idea that I think we, we both have lots of clients that um, when you retire from Northwest Ohio, most of the time you don't always stay in Northwest Ohio. You're either going down to Florida or you're going to Arizona. Or in this case, uh, lately we have a lot of people going to the Carolinas and to Tennessee. Those are the new hotspots. That's where you go when you retire from um, Northwest Ohio. So with all of these different people um, going in all these different spots, we said, well, let's kind of tell some stories about what we're learning from our clients that are moving. And this is very much not a book about, all right, you need to save X amount to get to here. That wasn't what we were going for. If you're reading this book and going through this book, you've pretty much done the things that you're supposed to, that you're supposed to do with um, with saving, with retirement planning. Now it's to the point where you've been responsible, you have enough nest egg, now let's enjoy it a little bit. And where do you wanna go and what do you wanna do? 
And if you're thinking about moving to the villages, for example, here's some things that you should know about the villages. These are, these are some stories that we've learned from our clients. These are some uh, things you should think about before you're moving. And a lot of it's fun stuff, but there's also facts in there too. Like, you know, how are estate taxes different in Florida? What's different about, um, you know, uh, flood insurance? You know, there, there's state income tax in Florida. There's all sorts of different things where people think you're just moving for the sunshine and a lot of people down there. It's not always the case. Sometimes there can be financial advantages too, but you need to, know, you need to weigh all of those. So I would say we don't dive deep into that stuff, but we just skirt it a little bit. We, we really wanted to write a fun book and something um, that was entertaining that you can learn something. Maybe you didn't know this about uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, or why, people are, why more people are moving to Nashville than any other country or any other city in the country. You know, there's, we just try and fill it in with uh, different, uh, different facts, but also give you some education along the way too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a fun book, like not a heavy read. And for people that are either like, I've had a couple different sets of clients with, with pretty good perspectives. And the first set was a little surprising because they were a little younger than I thought would be the target market. Um, but they're actually people that do have some means, but they were looking at different places they might want to explore because the next phase is probably going to involve them buying something somewhere yeah. and they want it to be the right place. And so like, this has got a lot of different kind of background, right? Yeah. And I, I think what you're finding too is, you know, nobody really, I shouldn't say nobody, but a lot of people don't really retire nowadays. You just kind of stop doing what you've been doing for a long time and getting paid for it. But then maybe you go on to another venture, you know, the days of working, you know, I'll say 25 years at Jeep and retiring with your pension and, you know, sitting in the couch and fishing, you know, it's, that doesn't, that isn't what retirement is anymore. Retirement nowadays, it's, it's really just, okay, now you've done what you have to do and you've been responsible, you've saved, you've got to a certain point. Now you can do what you want to do. And sometimes you make money doing that. And it's not where you, it's not in Toledo, Ohio all the time. Like I said, it's all over. So we wanted to, there, there's no real age range for this book. It's not like you have to be 65 to read this book. Just like you said, I have, you know, clients of mine that are down in, uh, you know, down in Fort Lauderdale area, they're 50. They just moved down there and they moved down there, but they can do their business remotely. And I think what this whole pandemic has brought up too is we're all learning how to do things remotely. Like what you and I right now, we're in the same building, but we're, you know, you, we can't be in the same room together without having to wear face masks. So you learn yeah. how to do things remotely. Yeah. I think it's going to be very interesting because you and I are considered to be pretty well traveled. A lot of that was going to see clients. You know, I have clients in Arizona, I have clients in California, clients, you know, clients really uh, all over the United States. And typically for a nice review, I would be sitting across the table from them. And now, yeah. Not only have I not been on a plane since early February, but um, I don't really have any plans to be on a plane anytime really soon. So it's not that it's not going to happen, but um, it doesn't have to happen anymore. And I think that gives us a lot more flexibility. But I also think that having the kind of background to know the places you really like, and if you're starting to map out where you might think about retiring, you know, the book's a pretty good start because it's a casual, not the deep, deep dive, but it gives you some nice touch points because between the two of us, after we were talking, I'm kind of recalling that conversation, but um, we have a lot of clients all over the place and they don't necessarily seem to be in the same places. I thought that was exactly. Yeah, exactly. And when we were kind of going down, I remember, I remember sitting down and mapping out this book and we said, Oh, do you have clients here? Do you have clients here? And we both kind of had some areas where there's a lot of clients, but then we have specific areas too. And that's how we kind of went through this book where, you know, I'd write a little bit about the villages, for example, you'd write about Arizona or Las Vegas or wherever it might be, yeah. but we have clients all over. And that's just, that's how financial planning works nowadays. And before we got into this pandemic, you and I both, we traveled, you know, a couple of times a month. If somebody needs our help down in, 
you know, down in Arizona, we're going to go down to Arizona and see him, you know, in a, yeah. in a lot of cases, I, I love doing the face to face stuff. It's when you, when you could do that again, it's different now, but when you could do that, it means a lot to a person that say that your uh, referral, say it's somebody's sister referred me, referred me to her brother in Arizona and they, you know, we'd have a conversation on the phone. We'd kind of figure out what we needed to do. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll be down there next week to help you out. And they're like, well, you're coming down here? I said, well, yeah, I want to sit across the table from you face to face and we're going to walk through what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. And that means a lot to people. And I think you and I are very similar in that fact. And that's how we've grown our practice is the way that we have. Yeah. And I hope that, you know, I hope there's a day where we're going to have the flexibility to do that when we want to. And then also people are now much more open to technology. I mean, uh, truthfully, if you go back a year ago, a lot of my clients have made a quantum leap in technology because if they want to see their grandkids, that you know, talk to talk to people that they're close to or do any kind of business also, they have to have now figured out how their FaceTiming, their Zoom time, their Zoom, they're doing, you know, there's a whole bunch of platforms, but they're they've gotten to be very good with some of those. Correct those ways and so that, that i think that's interesting too yeah once once this this pandemic hit in you know february march ish it's our business didn't really change the need for us didn't really change but how we did things changed dramatically i mean for, for me anyway there was still a huge need just because we're going through this it's not stopping people from retiring it's not stopping people from buying houses or doing different they still need money they still need our help we've just logistically had to change uh, uh, how we do things pretty dramatically. Yep. Yeah. And I also think it's interesting if, if, if I was going to put you on a spot and I'm not right this second, but like one or two of your favorite kind of clients or the favorite places that you tell the stories about, I, I got to tell you with mine, like maybe this guy's first name is Ted. I'm not going to say his last name, but um, he's got this little trailer in Florida that mm -hmm. is back on a canal like and he's got it is such an amazing setup this little trailer with this little room and he's got a boat and he he's got kayaks and he takes me through the the groves in the kayaks and he's 70 some years old i could barely keep up with him in the kayak yeah. like and it yep. was like that's what retirement's supposed to look like like ted still does some consulting like you spoke to and he does it, mm -hmm. he comes back up here, but he's down in Florida and he's doing, like he's really living a very full life, uh, completely mm -hmm. on his terms. Like, and people yep. oftentimes think that they're, they have to have a, so much money to retire and do these things. And that can mm -hmm. be the case. Like some of our clients have some, some pretty, pretty fantastic houses and places that they live. And those things are expensive, of course, but you also have some alternatives. I mean, we have a lot of people having an awful lot of fun that are seasonal campers and they, you know, or live in different situations. And the book, I think, kind of speaks to that. Does it, do any of those, like, you have any favorites of that kind of going through that story a little bit? Yeah. So I, I write a, a decent amount in the book about the villages down in Florida. And I'll kind of explain to you how I got started there a little bit. I had a client move down there um, back in 2009, 2010, and she was a school teacher up here. And then her brother lived down in the villages. So she moved down there because she went and visited her brother and really liked it. And so I went down and saw her and then I met her neighbor. And then I met her neighbor's cousin who lived in Leesburg, which is out there. And from there, it just kind of blossomed a little bit. And in the villages, I have probably 30 or 35 households down there now. And that's really just, and it's really just word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. But when people see you physically, just like you showed up at, uh, at Ted's place, people see, yeah. well, who is that person? Well, he's my financial advisor. Well, why is he down here? Well, he's coming down to see my review. And that gets lost so often nowadays in our business where people actually physically see you at their house or that you got on an airplane to go see them down in the villages that generates new business and more clients. And, you know, I could, one of my first trips down, uh, not one of my first trips, one of my first few years down in the villages, I would go down there 
I'll say three or four times a year, probably at least quarterly to see everybody. And, you know, you'd, you'd always catch a bunch of flack, like, oh, tough life, you're going down to Florida to see clients. Well, you know, when we travel down there, you you have six appointments, six appointments, and then you're back on a plane, you're in or back in Orlando on a plane at 6 a.m. to get back here. It's not like we're sitting on the beach doing or sitting by a hotel pool. That's not the case at all. When we go down there to work, we work. That's not playtime, that's work time. And so I would, so I typically fly into Orlando, then the villages is about an hour north of Orlando. So I'd go up there. Um, the villages is all golf carts, if you didn't know that. So I would go see one client of mine, borrow her golf cart for the day, and then I'd go see kind of everybody else. So I didn't have to drive my rental car. I'd take my client's golf cart to all my different reviews for the day. But as I was saying, getting back to one of my first trips down there, um, I have a, a couple of ladies who were, let me get this right through the U.S. Senior Games Table Tennis Champions. And what that means is, so table tennis is huge down there. Just like lots of different things are big down in the villages. There's 2,500, 3,000 different clubs that you can belong to. And I mean, everything from, you know, pickleball to belly dancing to table tennis, everything you want. You could be busy down there all day long, every day, or you could do nothing all day, every day. And it's you know, one of the, one of the big reasons why I enjoy it so much, it's like camp for seniors. Like you can do, you can be busy all day long and everybody there is active. Everybody's active. And I've never also, whenever you pull into the villages, it's kind of like pulling into Pleasantville a little bit, you pull on a street and every single person you drive by waves at you. Like everybody's happy to see you. They're just, it's just a happy place down there. So anyway, getting back to my story. Um, they said, well, we're gonna kind of take you around for the day. So I went and did my reviews um, with these two ladies independently. And then we went to lunch and they said, okay, you're, you're ours for the day. We're gonna take you and show you what, what we do. So they got us involved in a table tennis tournament, okay? And then after that, we went to the gun range, okay? And this oh. is two, they are in their early, they were in their early 70s at the time. And you go to the gun range at the villages and it's, load it like it's packed i mean there's literally everything you can do down there and i think when i started visiting down there so much that's really probably the biggest inspiration for me for this book is just to see how people are living and just see what people are doing it's just it's it's very inspiring to see active i don't want to say toledo ohio isn't the most active but it's not the most active because half the year the weather's not great and you know it's gray a lot more than it is down there but it's when you get in sunshine and you live in sun, there's something to the vitamin D. Like it does something to you. It puts you in a good mood and everybody's happy. And I think that's, like I said, that kind of transpired into like, well, maybe this would be interesting for people to read about, like to hear about table tennis tournaments and, and gun ranges. Like it's not all, you know, all the stories that you may hear, you know, all the, I don't want to say rumors, but things that you've heard about the villages, that's not like, it's not true like how it used to be it's, it's it's a huge community and there's always something to do it's, there's always something to do and everyone that i've ever encountered has always been super nice there yeah yeah i think there's I, I don't have quite as many clients down there as you do but i found that to be kind of one of the happiest places on earth like the disney land of of like retirees like they've they've done a good job they've saved enough money and they have all the all the bells and whistles and perks are all right there from nice restaurants to all the activities. It's a lot of fun. So um, when, when we there's were different areas too, like, sorry to interrupt. I just thought of one more thing. There's different, when you were talking about earlier, like some, some of our clients have this much, some of our clients have this much, Everybody everybody's different, but especially down in the villages, you know, you can buy a very, very modest house for about what you pay for a modest house in Toledo, Ohio, or you can buy a, you know, a mega millions mansion down there too. And our clients are all across the board. We have some, some clients that just are super modest and they wanted to get down there and they live almost for the same cost of living as they do here. And yeah. then you have some, you know, on different ends of the spectrum, but you don't have to be, a, you know, a millionaire to move down there. I've had clients with way less than that move down there and they live very comfortably. And we've even had some clients buy places in 
the one I'm thinking of is in Arizona, so not the villages, but you could do it in the villages. We're having some people buy them at younger ages and rent them out at the optimum times for rentals. And by the, the, the plan is that this thing will be paid off by the time that they're actually moving down there in their 60s. And so that too is a pretty cool setup. And it's pretty neat to be able to see people do this and to help them facilitate some of those things. They're still working up here. They want to spend some time down there. They know that's their place. Oftentimes they have family members that are down there or friends that, that are the game plan. Because if COVID did, did one thing for me, it's highlighted the people that you want to spend time with. And Absolutely. one of the things- <laughs> One that, way or the other, right? One way or the other, it, it's, it's, very, it's a very, very big deal. And yet another part of that is that you realize that the, when you're thinking of your retirement, you're thinking of your finances. You really aren't usually thinking of, of Jen and Bob's finances, who are your best friends who you want to hang out with. So I've actually got a lot of referrals over the last few years with that idea, like, hey, look around because, you know, you should make sure that Jen and Bob have the same means that you have because you don't want to be able to be somewhere, but you can't have your best friends along because they're in a situation where they can't afford to do what you want to do. So that oftentimes changes the, the setup for retirement as well. Yeah. It's so funny you mentioned that. I have a, a client of mine that lives in, and I just had this conversation with her last week. She lives in Phoenix, Scottsdale area, and she's 45. She's a doctor down there. And she wanted to set, we kind of set up a five-year plan for her, three to five-year plan for her to start putting money away to buy a place up in Sedona that she could rent out and use and make money from it. But then ultimately when she retires, when she's done, it'll be a place for her to go to. So there's a lot of that going on. You know, it's, in our world, you know, we deal with, you know, stocks and bonds, mutual funds, annuities, fixed accounts, all sorts of different things. But, you know, we also help our clients with real estate too. Like real estate's a big deal. If you can, you know, it's, if you're looking at property up in Michigan, for example, um, along Lake Michigan, if you're, you know, Holland, Grand Haven, you know, that uh, along the west side of the state there, there's not a lot of lakefront property left. They're not making more lake in Michigan, you know? (laughs) So if you can get your hands on a property now, what's it going to be worth in 10 years? And we try and, and I know you do the same thing too. It's, it's not just about, you know, stocks and bonds and 401ks and what's on your paper. Real estate can be a great way to gain um, financial wealth, especially going into retirement. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. So I'm, I'm curious the, pro- the process, because I think everybody's a little different and we used a ghostwriter to help us with our book, but what was, when you decided to start putting this stuff down, like, because, I can't tell you at this point, I've written several books. And the first thing that people say when they find out you wrote a book is they, they're, they're a little like they're often impressed and they oftentimes thought, think they should write a book, which I would agree. Everybody should kind of get into that. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's pretty neat. And, um, but I'm curious, like when you decided to start doing that, what was your process kind of for, for doing that? Because everybody's a little different. Yeah. So, um, as you said, we have a mutual friend that helped us out. You know, I think we all sort of know, but, or you should know at this, at this stage in life, what you're good at and what you're not good at. And I'm not a writer. I have lots of ideas, lots of thoughts. I can talk all day long, but when it comes to making it look pretty and write it, that's not my strength. And I know that. So, um, when we were starting to put this together and working with, um, working with our ghostwriter, it, it was, I found it to be very therapeutic. This is a way to um, contribute to our world and our business without necessarily, um, I don't say making money at it, right? Like if, if, and you know, we'll, we'll sell some of these, but this was nowhere near, this was, for me, isn't about making money. This is about getting the story out there and uh, really just sharing knowledge and sharing things that we've learned and the knowledge that we've accumulated along the way. And it's, it started to snowball after a while. You know, you'd start talking a little bit, and then next week you're, okay, we're going to talk about Florida next week. We're going to talk about Arizona next week. And through the week, I'd find myself getting lost. I'm like, you know, this would be neat to write about. I bet this people would find this interesting. And it becomes a little bit addictive and a little bit therapeutic that 
it's a creative outlet for our world. And in, and in our world of financial planning, you can be creative with how you plan and what you do with people's money. But, you know, writing a book's a different story. That's, you know, you're, now you're an author too, and there's some responsibility. You want to make sure that what you're putting out, it looks good, it reads good, and you're proud of it. So I think um, this started off as kind of a fun project, but then as we were going, it's like, all right, well, this is, this is going to be pretty good. I'm pretty proud of this. This reads good. This sounds good. I think people are going to enjoy this. So it was very therapeutic for me. And, and how long, like from the, from the minute, and I'm, I'm, if you ask me this question, I think it'd be tough for me to answer. Um, from when we were sitting there having the discussion, maybe we should think about this, to when this thing actually, you know, came to, came to be, like, wh what was the time frame, you think? Year and a half. Right. Like, I think it was pretty close to a year and a half. And, you know, you, like I said, you see this and you're like, oh, that's that's nice. But people don't understand just getting the cover. You know what I mean? Like when you you, you we hired a very um, talented designer, we knew what we wanted to do for the cover. And I think I, I it was very important for me to make sure that this looks good. Like, I love the coloring of it. I love the sign of it. I love the wording of it. And there was a lot of effort that went into this cover. but that took, you know, two months, two and a half months. And then you get a, you know, you get an email from the publisher saying, hey, you're off by two millimeters on the spine. And I'm like, well, I don't know what that means. You know, <laughs> like, I'm not a graphic designer. Like, right. So you send it to the designer, then you go back. It's, it's a whole process. There's a lot of people involved in this. You know, our names are on it. But, you know, how many, probably 10, 15 people that worked on it with us, like yeah. in one way, shape or form without client stories. I mean, sure. a lot of people put some time into it. Yeah. So yeah, probably a year and a half. And, you know, sometimes we'd get real hot and write a lot and then we'd take a little bit of a break and then you'd rev it back up again. So, I mean, it, it would go from hot and cold. It was never a real consistent process. It was, you know, I think there were a couple of times where we took a few weeks off, a month off. But that's also healthy, too, because that gives you some time to start the thinking thing like, hey, I want to write about this once we get together again. So, yeah. And because of our job, we have a heavier compliance load than most. So that's that's part of the process too, the back and forth and making sure everything is is, uh, you know, kosher with those guys, which it is. So we're good to go. <laughs> that front. Um, so yeah, you think proof, that, you, I was sorry, say, but, proofreading this. To like, I mean, you you read Terrible. through it the first time, and you're like, hey, this looks pretty good. You know, I like how this reads. And, the, and then you give it to a, I, I gave it to a client of mine that's an English professor. I said, hey, will you go through this and make sure that all the commas and, you know, again, that's not my world. I don't, my emails are mostly wrong. Like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. But, and then you get it back or you hand it off thinking, oh, this looks pretty good. And then you get it back and there's. 150 little sticky notes in here like well I didn't see any of that I mean editing it and going through it and marking it up I mean that took six weeks eight weeks to do oh yeah so. yeah so do you see yourself writing more books I mean I think for this this was kind of your idea and having a story to tell like what other mm -hmm. stories do you have to tell well the next thing that um my uh my fiance and I we started working on probably about a year ago is um, she's a photographer, a very talented photographer. And I've gotten into that. I picked up that habit along the way and uh, traveling for work. Like I would go see people in Arizona or, or like in Scottsdale or Sedona. Well, there's a lot of nice things to take pictures of while you're out there. So we would kind of morph into, we do our work, but then we'd go take pictures and we started gathering and we started meeting with publishers about putting together, um, a photography book and it is it probably won't have a lot to do with financial planning but like again this is a therapeutic outlet for me I like putting something on paper that people read that get enjoyment out of get a lot of pictures too that's a really fun thing that we do together and I think our next book which we've got a lot of the detail put together and we've met with publishers and trying to figure out the, the right way to go on this but I think we'll have a photography book out within the next year or two and I'm really excited about that. So as far as another one of these, I got lots of ideas, but I haven't really started working on them yet. I'm trying to keep it to one side project at a time because again, this is our side project, not our real job. So yeah. 
Yeah. So I get uh, with my books, I get oftentimes, you know, where can I buy the books? You know, are you selling books? Because I've got a bunch of them at the office and I'm not selling books out of the office. I generally will give one to a client or sometimes a client. Well, it's a nice way for a client to kind of get to know me a little bit because if you read the book, you kind of, be, you know, it's kind of got some some Steve flavor. It's got some Dan flavor and you kind of get get those vibes. So, um, but you can find our book on Amazon and we're going to put it, we'll, we'll, you know, it'll be popping up here in this this video time. You guys will be able to see it and check it out and we'll be able to direct you to to there and you can learn a little bit more about Dan, learn a little bit more about Steve, and it was very enjoyable. It's the first time I've ever authored a book with someone else, so it was. It took some of the pressure off. Steve's actually, I think, far more creative than me, so that's kind of a that was a very positive thing. I wouldn't me. go that far, but yes, <laughs> I definitely would go that far. I'm, but you know, like you said, it's it kind of takes a village for something like this. Like we, we certainly couldn't do it I, before I was able to write my first book. Like yours went off pretty seamlessly. I think I attempted six different ways before I actually was able to find somebody that could, could uh, kind of have my voice and have it sound like me. And um, that stuff's fun. So uh, anything else we should be reminding everybody of before we sign off here, Steve? Well, I think one thing is one of the things that I that got me into kind of thinking about this book and um, you know thinking about retirement in general is you and I we we have lots lots of clients and a fact of life is people people die people pass away and every you know every year every month you know we have a client that passes away and uh, a lot of the time these clients pass away without really have done anything with their money. They haven't spent it all. They haven't spent any of it because they're worried about running out of it. And I think one thing that I would encourage you to do is, as you're listening to this, as you're reading the book is do, first and foremost, do it responsibly, right? And make sure you consult with your financial advisor and make sure and do it the right way. But, you know, get out and enjoy your life, spend your money. You know, it's, it's everybody's, you know, everybody wants to leave money to their kids, different charities, different philanthropic causes. But you can do all of those things and you can still go out and enjoy your money. If you saved your whole life and got yourself in a good spot, use it, you know, be, be, be careful about it. And again, I'm not saying go out and buy a, you know, a five bedroom house on the ocean in Maui, but you can, you know, you can be responsible and get out and enjoy your life. Don't die with every dollar that you ever saved. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. That doesn't sound too morbid, does it? I'm not saying I'm not saying you should die, but I mean, it's but the we, truth. we've both seen it. We've seen so many people uh, that, and I think the baby boomers now are doing a better job of of living a little bit more. But you take that, mm -hmm. like my grandpa, he's he's 96, you know, still driving around the Grand Marquis every once in a while, and like you're not going to even when he was younger, like they would drive to go somewhere for like. They were, they're just, they're accumulators. They get the same yeah. satisfaction from putting money in the bank that many people get from spending it. And we're just saying, Hey, if you have these hopes and dreams and things, and the other thing is you get older and you might not be able to do it anyway. So in that, that target, right out, out, fresh out of retirement or where you're kind of working part time and doing these other things, like get out and do it. I totally agree. I couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, and and we've every spot that we've talked about has been somewhat tropical or responsible. But I just helped a client of mine; they're getting ready to retire in probably a couple of years. They lived in Cleveland, right outside, um, right outside Cleveland, and they bought a property and building a house in Medina, which is 45 minutes from Cleveland. But that's their retirement house, and they want to do that to be closer to their grandkids. It doesn't have to be a tropical spot, but their goal, their dream was to be build a house so they can be close to their grandkids and help raise them in Medina. And we, when we're going through, you know, I wasn't involved in the picking out the cabinets, obviously, but my advice to them is, you know, they've saved their whole life. They have plenty of money. They, they'll be able to do whatever they need to do. That's our job to make sure that you have plenty of money. But when you're going through and picking out the fixtures in this new house, spend a little bit more on the cabinets, right? You've earned it. Like the money's there. Like if once you figure out what you want to do, what your path is in retirement, 
do it the right way. You're not going to look back in five or 10 years saying, shoot, you know what? I wish I would have got those less expensive cabinets. You're just not going to do that. We've never, we've never had anybody do that. So do it responsibly, consult with your financial advisor, but get out and live your life. Do what you want to do. That's awesome. Good, good parting advice. Steve, thanks for taking the time today. I know how busy you are. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, you too, my friend. Talk to you soon. Here's the next book. Talk soon, yep, bud. Thanks. Bye-bye. Products and services using the following business names: Creative Financial Partners, Insurance and Financial Services, Ameritas Investment Company, LCAIC, Member FINRA, SIPC, Security Investments, Ameritas Advisory Services, AAS Investment Advisory Services, AIC and AAS are not affiliated with Creative Financial Partners. Products and services are limited to residents of states where the representative is registered. This is not offer securities in any jurisdiction, nor is specifically directed to a resident of any jurisdiction. As with any security, request a prospectus from your representative. Read carefully before you invest or send money. A representative will contact you to provide request information. Representative of AIC and AAS do not provide legal or tax advice. Please consult your tax advisor or attorney regarding the situation. Whew. Thanks for watching.